Hey there, everybody. My name is James Chai. I apologize. A little shaky in a few seconds here. Just trying to get everything all set up so I can uh, do a post. Uh, it is a bit earlier today. It is Sunday. Uh, Thanksgiving in Canada, where I am. I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. If uh, anybody is uh, coming up to Canada to visit, uh, please make sure you say hi. Uh, let me know that you come up here. Maybe, uh, maybe we can meet up, um, visit, see, say hi to your dog. Um, it's always nice to have visitors come to Canada and realize how amazing our our city is uh, because we have the ocean, we have the mountains, uh, we have um, the nice people, I guess, I think. I don't know. I'm Canadian, so I'm going to start apologizing, I think, in a few seconds here again for being nice. But uh, welcome um, again. Happy Thanksgiving, Canada. And uh, I'm looking forward to... Um, just doing a, a pretty short vlog today because uh, I'm heading over to some friends of mine, some really really good friends of mine who have invited me over for dinner with their family and uh, that'll be kind of cool. Uh, and they are making food that they know I don't, that, that I can eat, which is because I don't eat meat. So it's going to be kind of a cool thing. But I'm going to go nuts because uh, uh, the smell of the food is always going to be amazing and, um, you know. Anyhow, so what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to do a real quick one in regards to going over, well, it's going to be quick, like 45 minutes, but it's going to be about uh, one of the members in my closed reactive dog group, and they have a question, they have a Great Dane as well, and uh, just by coincidence, so they're going to ask, uh, they're asking a question, I haven't had a chance to read it, uh, I, I did skim through the first half of it, then I realized I have to get online before it happens. I want to thank people who've been sharing my posts, uh, yesterday's post in regards to why do dogs follow us into the bathroom and everywhere and Velcro. Uh, a lot of people have uh, commented and sent me uh, uh, their thoughts that they were quite um, surprised at what it means and why it works and why the codependency aspect of dogs following us into the bathroom and how it logically makes sense. And uh, there's other things too. I want to get to one of these days where I want to talk about one of the articles I read in um, in, a, in a BBC uh, a published uh, publication in regards to what uh, they're, they're they're saying that dogs' eyebrows have uh, evolved to become more expressive in the conduct when speaking with human beings, or interacting with human beings through the cohabitative aspects of the uh, <coughs> excuse me of evolution. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> excuse me. I don't want to talk about that at another time, just because that's a bit more of the uh, conjecture, the anthropomorph anthropomorphization conjecture of human um, uh, limitations because of the way they are approaching dogs. It's again from the top of the food chain as human beings, we are apex predators. Do you want to get to that part and kind of address it? <clears throat> I want to thank anybody and everybody who's uh, who's been able to subscribe to my YouTube channel, help support my work as well as following me on Twitter and Instagram. The more people who are following, the more what I'm doing becomes well-known, wider known, aside from the media aspect of it. But it's, uh, you know, my mission is getting through to owners, to families, to parents, dog parents of dogs that can be helped without having to kill them. And, uh, you know, again, our dogs are our children. Scientists, you know, they're, they're saying that dogs are emotionally like two to three year old children. So there is that visceral, emotional, intuitive connection that we have with our dogs, which uh, I'm really hoping one day science is going to advance themselves and open up more so because science itself is inherently obligated to explore novel approaches to rule out everything else because science does not become successful in theory unless it can be falsified, unless the science can be disproven. It cannot be called science, which is that paradox. You say it's real, well then let's prove it's not real. If we can't prove it's not real, but that it works, then you're right. So that's part of it. Um, sorry, I'm just shaking this off here to clear the screen. So that's why on my aspects of my work, everything that I have done with all the dogs that I've worked with, no matter what the breeds are, 100% successful, consistency, etc. I want to address a couple of concerns out of uh, a few people who have uh, expressed valid concerns in regards to how, why I'm always talking about Great Danes and that I uh, have a tendency to uh, make it appear that I'm singling out Great Danes and making Great Danes look like they're bad and that they're dangerous dogs, etc. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So, uh, you know, it's kind of like pit bulls, right? People who are uh, very passionate about protecting the aspects that pit bulls are not dangerous and they aren't dangerous. There's just a highly codependent dog that functions almost on an interdependent level. Uh, I talk about Great Danes because personally, they're my breed uh, favorite, right? It's the breed of dog that I personally adopt. Um, for me, I won't be, ad I don't adopt puppies personally. I don't adopt puppies even that have some moderate aggression issues. Regardless, it's the fact that I, I do very much love Great Danes and the Great Danes are usually 120, 150, 200 pound dogs. And if there's ever a situation that happens with a Great Dane and the fact that if they even just, you know, when they're playing and they just kind of mouth and because again, th th we're talking Great Danes have a PSI bite strength between 500 to 700 PSI. It's significant bite strength. And they can crush a man's forearm in one bite, literally. And I've seen them, uh, you know, I feed raw, so that happens all the time. End of the day, if a Great Dane nips somebody while they're just playing because they're not learning the bite strength, a lot of times when I've read this and I've been contacted by people like, Is my Great Dane going to attack me now? They're just learning how to do so, but the problem is because Great Danes are so big, people start to panic. And when people start to panic, they start to come to the conclusion that their Great Dane is dangerous or will be dangerous and then people end up killing the Great Dane. And a lot of times uh, uh, unskilled and or inexperienced trainers and behaviors will recommend the same thing. Um, and, and that's unfortunate for me as the ambassador of Great Danes and as my work has fully been entailed through an extremely dangerous pictorial Great Danes that are 150 pounds plus with significant attack histories, uh, vicious attack histories. I only see the worst of the worst, right? Just like the pit bull uh, misnomers of being dangerous pit bulls, right? And all that stuff. And I also want to say there's no such thing as a locking jaw on a pit bull. It's just because they're just so well built and they're so muscular that it's very difficult to, to pry their jaws apart. I have attempted to do so uh, with, uh, with Danes and so forth like that. Try doing that with them. It, it, it's next to impossible. Uh, well, it is impossible. You, you'll tire out. Very few people. People can pry the jaws open once they're locked on. There's always a difference on the way a, a dog, any dog, bites. They're either going to nip, they're either going to hold on firmly so they can sever, disable their prey by breaking their spine, or they are going to attack in the aspect of creating uh, uh, potentially critical injuries uh, to debilitate or disable their, uh, their prey as well, human or animal. And I have been on the other end of that. I do not, and, and there's an article, uh, a new segment on me um, uh, by the Vancouver Sun, and then there's a, a TV segment on it in regards to me working with a couple of Great Danes, and at the end of it, I say in that part, and this is like three years ago, where I say uh, the Great Danes are, are not for everybody, because they have the potential to be quite significant in danger if they're behaviorally, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, with issues. So I want people to know that if you have a Great Dane or you're thinking about a Great Dane, don't, okay? Just do your research first. Understand the power that just their natural size can affect human beings in the sense that people go, oh, well, you know, we expect a Great Dane to be gentle, not to bite hard, but to, to a Great Dane, to a massive, a Pyrenees, a great Pyrenees, their gentle bite is really quite gentle. I mean, when you see them playing with other dogs and, and puppies and doing play drive, right? Play drive, playing with each other. When they nip each other, they're, they're pretty hard on the nip, but to them, it's just play. On a human being, we have such soft, sensitive, easily terrible, uh, tearing skin. Uh, we lacerate quite easily, obviously, and then that ends up happening where it's misinterpreted by the human beings. And then the human being says, oh, this dog is dangerous, this great game is dangerous, this mastiff is dangerous, and we have to kill them. And people who are inexperienced will uh, say that in regards to my colleagues who are inexperienced. I, I am seeing videos. I mean, I'm looking on uh, one of the reactive dog groups and a uh, uh, reactive, aggressive, dangerous dog uh, support group. And there's, there's one where this guy is trying to put on, uh, uh, trainers trying to put on a muzzle. On, on one of their dogs. It's not even a Great Dane. It's a regular breed dog, right? That's why I generally don't talk specific about breeds. I'm talking about the dog themselves psychologically and, and so forth, but talking about breeds specific becomes the issue. Um, and this guy uh, is talking about this trainer who tried to put on a muzzle 
onto a dangerous dog, obviously to show off how good they are, and apparently sent the trainer to the hospital. And it was just an average sized dog, it's like 60, 70 pounds, so it's a small dog. And the issue happened, and then and the trainer went to the hospital having to get some significant stitches because he tried to attach the muzzle to the back of this dog's head instead of letting the owner do it. And then the dog turned on him, went to the hospital. Should have, you know, uh, 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 only somebody who's unskilled or inexperienced is going to go and say, oh, I'm going to put the muzzle on. If I meet somebody who has a dog, you know, most times they say, should we bring the muzzle? I say, don't bring the muzzle. Uh, we'll play it by ear. <clears throat> Excuse me, we'll play it by ear and then we'll leave it up to the uh, your dog's behavior to see whether or not if he needs to be muzzled. If he doesn't need to be muzzled, but he still wants to bite me, he's not going to be muzzled if they have care and control. I'm not going to be brave. It's creating context for the dog to understand what the human is doing around them. I'm not going to try to develop the rest of the dog's natural behaviors by muzzling him if it's not warranted or if it's not a safety concern. So this trainer uh, foolishly uh, attempted to show off how good he is and um, was then sent to the hospital. Anybody who, who, who works with an aggressive dog, dangerous dog, never take chances. And um, same with me. Like I said yesterday, every time I talk about vlogs, I'm deathly afraid of being attacked and I'm deathly afraid of critically being injured. Um, you know, one of the things I always do whenever I get a, a a dog and I bring him and I have a comfort with him and I put him in my back of my vehicle, my car, or, or you know, when I have my pickup truck on the road, up in the back of my vehicle, I'll go in backwards into the vehicle, literally blindly as I back into the vehicle and I'm prepared and I fear the feeling of being attacked, but I don't go in head first because they can go either for my throat or for my face, and then the disfiguring uh, aspects of it will be quite uh, difficult. So I go in backwards, so that way if they do attack me, they're going to get me in the shoulders or in the back of the head, and that type of uh, injury is not going to be fatal. And, and absolutely 100%, um, uh, my experience is something that I don't want anyone to do. But again, uh, when it comes to the breed, Great Danes being my personal favorite, um, I feel that I would rather warn people off and create caution because uh, I don't want someone thinking that Great Danes are awesome. Hey, Anne, uh, I'm glad everything's uh, going up there. Uh, I, I don't want to create an issue where someone goes and adopts a Great Dane or buys a Great Dane and doesn't properly socialize and train them and, and, and create good parenting, good dog parenting. And then that Great Dane becomes an issue uh, of behavior that they can't handle. And then they just let it get worse, like Lori Wingood did with her Dane Tsunami, letting that Dane of hers get worse and then ends up killing her instead of taking responsibility. So I want to make sure this happens. And yes, I'm naming names because she had a rescue organization that I set up and she deliberately uh, blocked everybody off of it. And um, um, I spent an hour on the phone with her on my free time. I told her I'd do it for free pro bono. And uh, so it just makes me upset when people are not taking care and taking responsibility. Even if your child causes an issue and breaks something in the, in the, in the store, you're going to be like, well, I got to pay for it or, you know, right. So, so that's the issue that uh, I'm going on. So I'm not singling out Great Danes. Yeah, I always go in backwards. I, I don't really go in slow. There's a certain connection that I have with them and I go at a certain pace that is uh, relative and it's relational to the dogs. It's like, Causes that their dysfunction and the way I back, back into them as well, and uh, and the way I talk to them, a whole bunch of things are different. Even like the Minky video where he's in the bottom of the seat, you know, literally 20 minutes, uh, well, an hour earlier, he was trying to bite me through the grate of the kennel that he came in, and he's covered in feces and everything, and I'm getting him into the vehicle while he goes into the floorboard, skittish fear, right? You know, very very shut down. My concern is, of course him attacking me and driving in my little car. It's basically like a jail, a prison that I would be viciously attacked. And I actually get him on in one, I think my second video, first or second video of that five video series of Minky's development in just literally only eight days, which Mark Ching, founder of Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, caught unbelievable and was overly impressed. Uh, and again, Minky's over 20,000 dogs that they've rescued. He, uh, meat farm, meat dog farms, everything. Mickey was the only dog that they couldn't handle, and they reached out not to Dr. Rebecca Ledger, not to Karen Pryor, uh, not to not to uh, 
who are these people who call themselves like there's a there's another guy Baldwin guy and all stuff. Not to any of these guys who offered to do so, they reached out to me, and I did exactly what I told them. I gave them an evaluation which they couldn't believe just by reading the dog over the photos and their description. I didn't even see videos of them, and they were like, "Wow!" And then I said to them, "Yeah, won't be using any treats or medication." And you watch the videos. I'll put it in this description thing uh, when I get back from uh, Thanksgiving dinner. And I did what they call impossible, but again, it's not impossible what I do because we all have this inside of us. I, I need to convince people that you, the people who are watching this, that you can do this yourself. I'm teaching you guys how to do this for free. This is 100% possible. Uh, like the same thing like yesterday's uh, blog, uh, vlog in regards to why does our dog follow us into the bathroom? Not only is it the codependency aspect, it's because a dog sees the bathroom as a superficial aspect of the home environment, right? And you and people are like, wow, we didn't think that. We thought it was other issues. No, it's just normal behavior for this dog to follow you in the bathroom. Why? So watch it. You'll see that. Um, and what did I taught you? It was something that would have cost you $150 to hire a trainer. Um, hey, Kim. Two male, four year old days. I'm sure you have no furniture that's sitting in the same place. They're so rambunctious. Um, but yeah, so it's just in that part again, um, the stuff I'm talking about, like I say, as you start to follow my journey and the way I'm thinking, and like I said, I'm wildly organic. I'm all over the place. I'm extremely passionate about saving lives of all our dogs. Doesn't matter if you have a Chihuahua, doesn't matter if you have a Pit Bull, doesn't matter if you have a German Shepherd. Um, I think Gina Strickland had uh, mentioned in Peace, Love, Danes, like, you know, why am I always talking about Great Danes? And then I said, okay, well, and I showed her, I think, about 12 different breeds of dogs, Great Pyrenees, right, you know, Black Lab, and all that stuff that I've worked with, skittish dogs. Hey, Amy. Um, uh, Amy Reynoshek is from Save Rocky, the Great Dane Rescue and Rehab uh, Charity. They have anywhere from 80 to 100 plus Great Danes in their rescue organization at any given second. So uh, they have the extreme extremely high expenses, uh, phenomenal charity, and they will take the Danes that are quite quite difficult at times, and they will try to help them. Um, and they they asked me for help uh, for pro bono online consults and so forth like that. And I mean, Amy, you can attest that my accuracy is 100%. Again, it's not something that makes me magical. I Okay, so so I, I, a, few, a few people have said to me, uh, you know, high up people like seals and stuff like that said, you know, you got a rare gift with this. You should, you know, not say that and blah, blah, blah. But I've realized, except for one person, well, 80 Danes, well, um, one person um, who, who is uh, Shelton, um, uh, Alan Shelton, who, oh, thank you, uh, Alan Shelton, who, who's written a coaching book worked with uh, seals, Nike and Vans uh, and worked for Amazon as a VP. You know, he said, just tell people you have a gift. So, okay, I do. I have a gift, but again, I live a, a humble, modest life. My focus is on saving the dog's lives. And so everything that I'm doing, thank you, Anne, uh, is everything that I'm doing is to help you as your dog's parent to emotionally connect in a way you've never understood before that's existent. Not to look at your dogs as just superficial and to just discard the dog and, and, and kill your dog, uh, but it is actual fact to have a presence. Not to treat train your dogs, like, like they have the skittish dogs coming in from Taiwan where a few of their local rescues here uh, are going to treat trainers even though they know I, and they've seen me work with these Great Danes and with the skittish dogs, Formosan, Mountain Dogs, which I have my own who has only two legs, Sammy, uh, Jindos, Shiba Inus, all that stuff. And just working with them viscerally. But instead they want to go to a treat trainer because they don't understand what's going on or they have a personal animus against me, which is like, well, you're punishing and killing these dogs because you don't like me or because you don't understand what's going on, even though it works. Right? That's human arrogance. And uh, eventually, as you follow my journey, I'll eventually start talking about these organizations because hopefully I'll be um, able to spread what I'm doing so that way they will then be, if it's public shaming, it's public shaming. But you know what? When I'm hearing these things about these dogs being medicated needlessly, when I'm hearing about these dogs who are not even just being medicated but then are being recommended to be killed when I'm dealing with them in one session, it's disgusting and it's immoral, it's unethical. End of the day, what I can teach you guys 
uh, my followers and people is is again coming from my over 1400 days over 20,000 hours of experience Amy knows when I had Nero how significantly dangerous he was I take these guys these these dogs that other people have abused severely and treated horribly and have caused what they would call ticking time bombs I bring them into my home knowing this I, I've seen the injuries the, the, the significant skin peeled off of people's arms from, from attacks. And I bring them in, knowing that they're also dog reactive almost 95% of the time. And male reactive, because it's always men, almost always men that beat the dogs, because men are insecure. Morons we are sometimes, or most times, we're idiots. And we can't say that we can't admit these things, and we just start beating our dogs. So at the end of the day, I'm taking unknown, impossible dogs and helping them and stabilizing them and down training them without medication, without treats, without muzzles. Free range in my home. I've been cornered. I've been up against the wall. I've been up against furniture. I've been up against tables waiting for a dog to, to, to come in on me, to attack me. I mean, Amy knows Nero. Nero is significant resource guarding. Couldn't get anywhere near him. And then within 10 months, I have my face around his head while he's eating a beef bone, a raw beef bone I've given him. All of this can work. It's literally taking your child who's having a nightmare and helping them understand that the world is not going to blow up, that the universe is not going to end. Right? I, I believe in God. So it's our compassion to help. So this is what I'm doing. So please share my work. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I, I've got 441 followers uh, now on, on YouTube. I need a thousand uh, followers. I need to have 4,000 hours uh, of watch time on it. Um, I didn't know all this stuff because I'm just trying to get my word out. But the more it gets out, then it allows me to have a, a larger um, distribution. And again, the more people who know can see it. You compare my work. I mean, you know, Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation could have t asked, didn't ask uh, Minky to go to, to Caesar Milan, who's who did a feature on on their foundation. They came to me, and I do what I'm doing. So, and I'm teaching people how to do this. And and so, um, it's just not like the Great Danes. It's not just one breed. It's not what. It's just dogs in general. Like the human psychology, there's eight different, four or eight different types of human psychology. Uh, um, uh, oh wow! Oh wow! I'll have to read that later. Um, you you know what, Amy? Send me the photos, right? You know, set up a group PM, like if they'll let you, right? Because I know the humane societies are sometimes, uh, you know, not, you know, they like to do things internally, but set it up. I, I, Right, seen every single dog I've ever worked with with you, right? Even with Faith, uh, Great Dane, that she was going to surrender out in Florida. I mean, out in the South Florida, the Anne's thing, uh, out in Hawaii, right? Now she's got her, and she's like, within whatever, right? Within like a day, it was already moving forward. Jackie, uh, uh, who, who admins uh, awesome Mastiff lovers, I, I talked to her about her show dog, and she literally s sends me the the thing, and it's posted on my page. Literally the next day huge difference but it's not a huge difference it's just saying I understand what's wrong with you it's like talking to somebody on the phone and you don't know and they kind of sound funny and then you and they're acting like jerks and then the next day you find out that their mom died but they didn't say anything you're like okay so what do you do you don't go over there and say well I'm gonna start beating you I'm gonna put a prong collar on you I'm gonna get you some medication I'm gonna give you some ice cream cone or beer or alcohol to, or drugs to, to do away with your dysfunction and your pain and depression you say Dude, or do that. Let's go and just sit here and let's go for dinner. Let's just talk and let me know what's going on. Or you want to hang out? We can talk about you. You know, I, I know you're upset. Your mom died. Like that kind of stuff. That's what we need to do with our dogs. Only problem is we don't know how the dogs are functioning, and we're listening to the uh, academia, the the B PhD behaviors, and all these things who have no idea what they're talking about about dogs. They're like, oh, we're certified and all this, you know, credentials and all this stuff. But then at the same time, it's an unregulated industry that has created their own self-credentializing industry. They're regulating themselves, the blind leading the blind. 
these these academics and these PhD behaviors and these well-known beha- trainers and behaviors, they only have a 60%, barely a 60% success rate on 100% of the dysfunctional dogs. The other 40% are being killed. These are the dogs that they can't handle and they're always trying treats. Dr. Ian Dunbar says if the dangerous dog doesn't take food as a treat, you kill the dog because the dog can't be fixed. I take these dogs and whatever. N- Nero <laughs> was brutal. He grabbed me once by the top of the head just to warn me. Caused my temples to bleed. <laughs> so, so this is what I'm saying. Is that there's so much of an advent of... Uh, Belief that things can't happen because the dog is dumb and stupid and we got to give treats. And like I said, nowhere in the entire canine species does food exist as a reward feed, much less a communication device. Only time food's used is when the mom gives the, the their puppies food. So why do something that's so human and arrogant by saying the dog's got to take food to buy for their dysfunction? feeding the drug addict more drugs. So I go after all this stuff, but I talk about the Great Danes. Getting back to the parties, I talk about the Great Danes because that is my breed favorite. And that is my belief. That the the, the people who think Great Danes are dangerous are going to be the people who are going to go, you know what, I don't want to take a Great Dane unless I'm willing to commit. Because a Great Dane, three to four times the cost of a regular dog. It's really expensive to own a Great Dane. I have I, I feed two to three hundred pounds of raw to them every single month, not including just the medication, uh, or not if it's needed, or or you know if I, if I if I give them uh, uh, supplements, I don't just give them like one supplement. I have to give them multiple supplements when that's the case. Same with medication, all the stuff. The cost is significant. Just don't be taking a breed on that they themselves don't have the financial ability, such as getting pet insurance to, to commit, you know, going through the training to understand relative tolerance that if a, if a Great Dane is nipping at you, they're just playing and they don't understand their bite inhibition. The reality is, if any dog, including a Chihuahua, a teacup Pomeranian, if any dog wanted to hurt us, they would freaking hurt us brutally. When a dog grabs you and just shakes you and bites you and lets go, just warning, it's part of the negotiation. And and that's another topic, right, in regards to the dog's cognitive processing in in regards to fight or flight, not fight or flight, but defensive measures and offensive measures and and interpretation and misinterpretation. Again, as we go through this journey, as more, uh, once I hit that thousand subscribers, I'm going to start talking about how dogs process pain. I'm going to talk about how dogs process their field of vision. I've already talked about how dogs process time through abstract memory and, and slivers of frame. But once I get at that 1,000, then I'm going to start talking about in actual psychological details on the psychogenetic rooting of that or behavior and where it runs through and how instinct is created in a dog as in, in a human. All these aspects, the world I live in, I mean, I, 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 it literally takes me. Like if I see something happening that's not normal in, in dog behavior or I haven't noticed it before, and I don't want to, and I, again, I'm not saying I, I'm tuning my own horn. Own horn. I, I, I see things and I process things in such a fast rate of speed at two tenths of a second. Uh, I got to go to Thanksgiving later on uh, uh, here in Canada uh, with some really amazing friends of mine. Yeah, my YouTube, it's, on, it's in my description thing. Uh, YouTube.com forward slash C as in channel C forward slash vid dog training, but it's in my description thing. Um, and you see the videos on all these dogs in, in my YouTube channels. Every single one of them muzzle. One of them muzzle muzzle punches me right in the face. Thirty six minutes worked him right out, and I'm predicting his behavior in real time. So what I'm saying is, please pay attention to what's going on with your dogs. It doesn't matter if it's a, a small dog, a big dog. They can kill you if they wanted to. Well, not the Chihuahua, right? Okay, or the Pomeranian, but the larger size. Well, you know, twenty, thirty pound and up dogs. They get you in one place, you're done. The larger dogs, when they get you, they... Th- there's a thing about the larger giant breeds. They have such confidence and control of their physicality and their predacious nature that they know how to stalk and kill. There's a big difference. That's why when you see wolves and you see lions, the way their behavior is, you see the gracefulness, the casualness, the confidence that they have. It's a logic-driven behavior. 
logic drive, emotional drive. So um, I love the Great Dane breed. It just hurts me so much to see so many being killed. Anywhere between 1,200 to 1,800 Great Danes are up for rescue in North America at any given time. It's crazy that many. So I love Great Danes. Beautiful breed. Unfortunately, all the ones that I have are always reactive, right? I have one from uh, Erica Kelly, uh, Once Upon a Dane, right? I mean, she's a great rescue. Same with Save Rocky. Same with uh, 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 groups like Peace Love Danes and, and, and all these other breed groups, German Shepherd groups and so forth like that they've invited me into. Um, just, anyways, just, just letting you know, I'm not sour on Great Danes. I absolutely love them. And then again, I'm taking the ones that just make me have very sleepless weeks and months. I mean, Amy, you saw when years back when Nero first came and he went to attack me and he's like, uh, I got to make sure I got screen, the screen properly. And he's this close for my face and he's growling. And it's a low guttural, a low guttural growl. And he's this close. And I'm sitting there and he's this high on my head. And I've got my left, actually, yeah, because he's there. Actually, his head's here. And he's, I've got my left hand up here. So in case he goes for my throat, he'll get my arm instead. That's my preparation, is that if he goes to kill me, he'll get my throat, and at least it'll be jammed up against my head while he goes to kill me, and then I can at least hopefully push him off or punch him off if that happens. And he's, you, I don't know if you remember that, Amy. Now, Francis saw it too, right? We were on that group PM that I, I set up, and I sent you guys a link. It's just, and it's that guttural growl, that's primal growl. And I'll tell you, it's extremely freaking scary. And then what do I do? Good boy, taking care of him. Working with him at his speed of uh, behavior. All right, so uh, don't uh, don't you know? If you have any breeds, let me know. If you have any questions, uh, if you have a, a behavioral issue with your dogs, if you're in my closed group and the link is in my description, join the group. Say you saw me on YouTube. You got to make sure that you uh, are, are subscribed to my YouTube and following my Twitter and my Facebook. There's a few people who I helped and they still aren't following me, but you know what can you do? Um, but. Once you're inside my group, then you can post a question. There's a proper way of posting it. The guidelines are in there, and then you get help for free. And you're getting help from somebody who's considered the best in North America with extremely dangerous to predatory giant dogs. Yeah, Amy, I mean, it's a. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Um, I was talking to uh, Lori today, and. Um, thank you, Cameron. Um, Talking to Lori from Peace Love Danes, uh, she's really nice, and she actually has really great, amazing things to say about you. Because uh, you know how these all our, all these little groups all seem to hate each other and all stuff, right? Or, or you know, there's certain things. But she was like, "Yeah, no, Amy's really, really awesome." Her, 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 thirteen and a half year old Great Dane, his name is Rocky. And I was like, "Oh, just like Save Rocky." She goes, "Yeah," and and I said, "So he's the original Save Rocky." But you know, um. I was going to say to Lori, and I kind of started to tear up a bit So when I was typing to her, but um, uh, Nero passed away. Uh, you know, I had to bring the vet in to, to kill him, right, because he was, in, he was uh, 13 years, 7 months, 1 day, uh, 1 week old. And yes, I say kill him because I'm taking responsibility. I had to ask for him to be killed because of his age and his... Uh, and I mean, I carried him in and out of the house. I, I expressed his bladder. I've done that with a previous Great Dane, my beloved Nero, my beloved Lincoln, where I, I used urine catheters on him. I, I would manually defecate, help Nero defecate <laughs> for several months. Um, you know, he uh, Amy let me know that Save Rocky, Rocky, the, the reason for Save Rocky, uh, that Rocky died the same month and day June 11th, um, a, a couple years before, but three years before, Nero, uh, yeah, four years before, oh no, three years before, sorry, three, four years, I can't remember, um, that Nero died the same day as, as Rocky did, uh, and um, an amazing coincidence, of course, because I didn't know that, and, and yeah, um, but yeah, so anyhow, I, I'm going to go on to this uh, this uh, post here, um, and then, oh, she, oh, yeah, <laughs> It's so amazing. It's so um, absolutely amazing. Um, and I want to. And again, yesterday I kind of mentioned a, 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 someone by the name of Suzanne Fetner. She runs a, a Great Danes of Our Hearts. I want to uh, just send out to Suzanne. I hope you get help for your issues and all that stuff. I accept your apology. 
um, and you know you might want to look into a 12-step program to be able to help those things um, not singling you out I just think that um, you could really use some help and uh, um, it's important that you get help because um, you've got a lot of good stuff that you can do for people and I think you should utilize that amazing inside part of your heart and uh, I have tried very hard to be patient and help but uh, unfortunately it's just I'm done um, but I do want you to get some help Nero had an amazing you know when I adopted Nero at 10 years four months of age Amy um, I considered it maybe three to six months I didn't want to fall in love with him. I just thought, I'd just take an old dog. He's reactive. Whatever, right? <laughs> right? Dangerous. Whatever. I saw the scar. Or I saw that. what happened to uh, your foster's uh, 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 adult uh, family member. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah. He would live three to six months. And then that would be, I, my heart won't hurt because I, I cried so badly when uh, Lincoln died. Um, and then, uh, you know, three years, over three, three years, four months, uh, uh, three years, three months, I mean, that Nero lived. He was happy. It was just his personality was just amazing. You know, the bond that uh, we have when we're working with a dog that is extremely dangerous, it's unbelievable. It's it's going through hell and high water and sustained for, for weeks and months at a time. You can't fight that. You can't dispel that. You can't lose that incredible bond. I mean, that's true love, right? It's true love in the most emotionally soul-based context. There's just stuff that's, uh, if I, if I said about some of these dogs, you guys would be just like, we're, <laughs> anyways, uh, I mean, as you know, Amy, like the stuff I talked about Nero two, three years ago when he was doing that and all those other things that I talked to you guys about, I never publicly talked about. I sent you guys the video so you knew I was telling everyone the truth in the group so that no one could say, oh, James is making this up. And you, I remember you guys all saying, expressing quite, quite significant concern about my safety um uh but that 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 journey is unbelievable it's like being in the wilderness with only one other person it's like being on a deserted island and having to survive like the tom hanks and wilson thing right you know it's really that kind of bond um and it's it's really hard to get over to be honest with you and i understand people say you know it's been two years i can't get over the uh, i i really do i really do Okay, so I'm going to get to Melissa. Uh, she's in my close group. Uh, I got to do that because I got to go and uh, go to my friend's, uh, amazing friend's um, dinner and all that stuff. Um, yeah, I, I'd i be happy. Like I said, Amy, I am looking for another Great Dane to adopt. 150 pound minimum or preferable 150 pounds or heavier. 35, 36 inches withers minimum, right? Wither height minimum. Uh, attacked at least six to nine people. Must be male reactive, must be dog reactive, must be unpredictable, uh, must be extremely dangerous. Um, just like Nero, like Tonka. Well, Tonka. Tonka was the most extremely dangerous Great Dane in North America. That's why the newspaper covered him. Um, so yeah, so yeah, as you know, Amy, I'm 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 questing, right? All, all these other Danes that come in, all these other dogs that have issues and dog reactivity, like they they fight and they attack each other in the first couple of days, and I'm always watching out that. And, I, and like I said, when we go on the journey, I'll, I'll let you guys know how to deal with that as well. I talked in a previous episode about how to address two dogs fighting and how to stop them without getting hurt, especially a predatorial dog, because it doesn't matter if they know you and you try to stop them or are extremely dangerous or whatever, they will turn on you thinking that you're part of it, and then they will become predacious against uh, the human. Uh, who's trying to break up even for your friend or your your own dog so that's why i always say that my scale is so much different All right um i don't know i just i am so afraid amy when i do this uh with these guys but uh I, i'm gonna keep doing it oh okay well, yeah let's talk about this later on let's talk about this later on uh, i'd be happy to help oh cool we have to change the name Cookie. <laughs> Who wants a cookie? Who wants a treat? All right, so I'm gonna go on to this, and then I'm gonna and then I boot out because this is gonna take me about 20 to 30 minutes. Melissa Stanley, if you're online, uh, please uh, comment that you're online. If you're not online, then you're not online. 
uh, and I will start reading off what she says, and I'm going to uh, break it down. Um, okay, cool. I will break it down uh, through it. Look in the description of this vlog. You'll see what I'm talking about, so this way I'm not going to have to go over it, and then we'll just kind of spontaneously, organically go over the, the issues that are going on. All right. Hi, James. I'm a member of the group, and I've subscribed to your YouTube channel. Thank you for your helpful and informative videos. I need some advice for my dog, please. Bauer, and again, the other day I was talking about using the dog's name, right? So Bauer. Bauer is a seven-month-old Great Dane currently weighing 90 pounds. We brought him home when he was 14 and a half weeks old. Our household consists of myself, my husband, our three kids, and a six-year-old male Chihuahua. Sprocket. The Chihuahua is the guy in charge. He quickly set boundaries that Bauer obeys. However, Sprocket is an extremely yappy dog who barks at everything. The kids are not with us full time, so there's lots of moving parts in our household dynamic is constantly changing. So we're seeing the fluid aspect of it, so there's an interchange back and forth in the household. The dogs are not understanding, so Bauer and Sprocket are not, um, you know, Sprocket by the sounds of, uh, how is it, how is Sprocket? Oh, okay. I don't know how old Sprocket is. Okay. Um, so, oh, six-year-old, sorry, six-year-old Sprocket. Okay, Sprocket, the Chihuahua, six years old, and then uh, Bauer, seven months old uh, right now. So there's a lot of things going in and out. So Sprocket himself is raised before I even going on. That's all of the part. Sprocket understands his his uh, indigenous uh, uh, relevance to the home, right? He knows the position where he's in the home. Like I said before, I come from a family of eight. I know I'm number six in the home. Doesn't matter. I know that I'm number six, below five other brothers and sisters, and I'm above seven and eight, right? So Sprocket knows where he is. Keep this context with every single dog. I talk about C. Nordy in other other uh, other vlogs. So he quickly set boundaries that uh, Bauer obeys. So what essentially has happened right off the bat there? So if you got him at fourteen and a half weeks, and that means Bauer is about six months, uh, six years, uh, five years of age ish, uh, well, or five and a half years of age, give or take. And so that means right off the bat that Bauer uh, had learned the things from from Sprocket in the sense that Sprocket was being somewhat not necessarily territorial, but Sprocket was just going, hey. Um, let me figure out where you are in your behavior and so forth like that. I could talk about negotiation, right? So like I said, once I hit a thousand followers, I'm going to start kicking it into the psychogenetic aspects of it. Then you guys are going to be like, holy crap, this is unbelievably insight, uh, in, 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 intuitive, insightful. I mean, obviously, uh, otherwise I would be dead. Yeah, um, Bauer was diagnosed with colitis about three months ago after lots of testing and weeks of diarrhea. He's on Thailand, uh, Thailand powder, one-eighth teaspoon twice a day. Once he started the meds, he immediately started gaining weight and thriving again. Uh, when it comes to medical aspects of it, I have very limited understanding and knowledge. I, I, I'm happy, happily admit that I don't know. And if I had more time, I would have Googled all this stuff. I don't know uh, specifically about colitis and all that stuff. Um, uh, the diarrhea, I mean, it's obviously a digestive issue that I'm guessing. Um, so again, um, hey, Wendy. Uh, so again, I don't really, uh, you know, again, share my stuff, right? Subscribe to my YouTube and, and get my stuff kicking out there. And then we're going to start, then the stuff is going to go on. Um, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, getting back to the thing, I don't know much about medical issues and so forth. So I'm just going to keep it out of other than, you know, a lot of times behaviors, Right, and trainers will say, "Well, there's a medical aggression issue and all that stuff." Right? I mean, Amy, you know, Nero ended up having like within the the first year, he was diagnosed with testicular cancer because he came to me intact. I didn't know that. I knew he was intact, so he had the hormone issue, right? The testosterone. I knew all of that. I was like, "Yeah, you were like, yeah." And I said, "Are you gonna get him neutered?" You said, "No." I'm like, "Okay, well, that's fine because he's too old, anyways." Obviously, you know, we got that taken out by the vet later on because it was bigger, and then you know. I don't really tend to look at dogs' testicles. It's just not my thing. Um, so the thing is, um, you know, uh, I've taken a dog that has a medical issue already, right? Uh, you know, Tonka was partially blind from being beaten so badly and, and hearing impaired and had slight brain damage, which uh, Lloyd never told me about that. And that was that was uh, something that was quite significant. Um, but anyhow, uh, getting back to the part of, of the medical issues. So we, uh, when it comes to that, for me, I deal with it. Right, because you know, for example, if your friend, you're walking with your friend, and they and they and uh, say, for example, um, you know, they have a migraine, and you know they have a migraine. They tell you have a migraine. They tell you that they have a migraine, and you know what they're like when they have a migraine. That they're irritable or they're just shut down or whatever. What do you do? You're like, okay, then you know they have it, and you accommodate them. You're like, okay, well, you got 
this, this, this issue with you, the migraine, it makes you irritable and you're going to lash out. And so I'm just going to kind of, you know, the baby gloves on, right? Of course, or, or, or respectfully without being patronizing. Same thing with our dogs when they have a medical issue. When it's relatively manageable, but if it's a significant issue or a gaping wound, etc., we have to take that into consideration. Another thing I want to kind of point out actually is if it drives me freaking nuts when I see see uh, trainers, behaviors, uh, veterinarians, uh, and, and even dog parents when the dog has like huge, you know, has a wound and stitches, and then the vet's going like this. Oh, it doesn't hurt the dog. It doesn't hurt the dog. No, no, look at it. I'm touching it. And the dog just got out of surgery an hour ago. Oh, no, the dog's fine. Or they're trying to debride the, the injury or whatever, right? They're trying to clean it off. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, it's fine. No anesthetic. And the dog is sitting there. And, and you don't see the reaction, but they're not understanding the way the dog is processing pain. See, there we go. So, so then they're like touching it, but it hurts the freaking dog. If we had a wound, right? You see, I have scars on my arms. If we had a wound, right? If we had a wound and they, they stitch it up and we got 14 stitches and somebody went like this, oh yeah, you're okay, you're okay. We're going to yell at the person to stop touching us because it hurts like freaking crazy. And that's why I say academia, behaviors, they're not looking at dogs as living, feeling beings. They're just like, oh yeah, the, the, the wound's okay. The dog is feeling it. And how can I prove the dog is feeling the pain? Because if your dog is reactive, if you have a reactive, dangerous dog, and they're sleeping, and you go like this... They'll instantly wake up and go to attack you. Well, they'll attack me because I triggered them on purpose that way. They will go immediately attack you. If your dog's laying there and you just touch them, you notice how the skin flinches? You notice if you start to pet them lightly, they feel it and they turn on their back? Processing of the pain aspect. That's why I talk about the redundancy. See, the scientists, the behaviors are just like temple ground and they're just like arrogant human beings. So the dog is feeling the pain, the medical issues, all that stuff. We take into context. And then, well, now that makes sense. Like the behaviors, like Dr. Ledger gets close to the understanding that there might be an aggressive issue due to med medical concerns. But they're not putting it into context. Like, oh, if there's a medical uh, if there's an, a medical issue, then you medicate the dog. Mm, well, why don't you just accommodate the dog's injury first? All right. Okay, getting back to this here again. All right, so uh, thriving gait, uh, weight gain and all that stuff again. My issue with Bauer is that he is quickly getting bigger and I'm finding it hard to manage him on the leash. If he sees someone on our walks and he immediately starts barking and growling at the people. He pulls, excuse me, he pulls and lunges to get to them. If a stranger is brave and comes over, he will bark in their face. Once he senses that they're not a threat, then he'll stop for 15 seconds and then typically starts barking again in their face. Then he tends to try to get away like he seems scared. He took, uh, We took him and Sprocket to the dog park and he did wonderful with the other dog. He was playing other dogs. He was playing gently with the other dogs. Some more aggressive than he would, than he would bully him. Oh, some of the more aggressive dogs would bully him and he, I would have to shoo the other dog away. But if a person approached at the park to talk to us, he would bark his head off at the person. He has never bit in anyone or even nipped ever, but it scares people when he behaves this way. He does mild, right? Mild, the nipping, right? He does mild when he plays, which we're trying to correct. My goal for Bauer is to get to be able to go on a leisurely walk. It's kind of like uh, Amy, like with Faith's dog, right? With the pulling and the trying to attack people, and now her dog's fine. Um, I want him to just relax and enjoy it. He's constantly scanning the area on the lookout for a threat, and once he sees something he doesn't like, I cannot snap him out of it. He's so focused that he doesn't hear me. He has learned basic commands such as sit, stay, paw, and down. Um, so I'm going to go to my reactive group itself. Um, I'm gonna, oh, okay, I see you're sending something here. Okay, so because Melissa has also posted some photos uh, of um, of um, uh, Bauer, and and I think we see Chihuahua uh, uh, Sprocket there. Okay, so we're seeing Bauer in the first picture. He's sitting down. This is the photos in the clo in my clo in my reactive dog group. Like I say, if you want to see it, you can go ahead and and join the group. So we see him sitting down there. Uh, you know, it's, it's an immature dog, obviously a juvenile dog. And then the next one, we see him. He's at the obviously the the play area where it is on the astro turf, um, and Bauer's just standing there while there's three four other dogs around him. And then the next one is uh, oh, it's a video. Okay, so Bauer's. Oh, let's just hear what Bauer's saying. Okay, 
I don't know. Oh, okay. So uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a one second video. So uh, two second video. So it's just kind of being repetitive. And he's just watching other dogs, and he's making eye contact uh, with uh, with whoever's uh, recording this. Uh, all right. And then the next photo is uh, him in the back seat of their uh, van or a huge vehicle. Um, he's looking out the window as he's staring at something. And then he is in his kennel with a nyla bone. Uh, do not ever give your dog nyla bone. It's plastic, and it's thread plastic, and that threaded plastic will if they start eating it will start gumming up inside their system. Same with rawhide. Rawhide's chemically produced, bleached. That's poison you're putting into your dog. Uh, that's uh, why we go, oh, well, why has our dog got cancer now? Right? These, these, these garbage things are going on to them. You, ne you know, like I feed all my dogs raw, you'll never see, you never hear of a wolf being found with cancer. Zoos feed all their carnivores raw. They don't feed them kibble. So, uh, so uh, don't forget, the pet industry is worth almost seven zero seventy billion dollars in 2018. There's an incentive. Um, you know, there, there are good dry dog foods. There really are good dry dog foods out there. But I'm not out there to promote any particular brand because I'm not getting paid for it. So, <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. I just, you know, I just, I leave it up to people to do what they want. Um, oh, and the other thing too, when your dog eats grass... Be really careful, and I and I saw this in a post several years ago where what happened is their dog, and I can't remember if it was a Dane or another breed, their dog was eating a bunch of grass, which is long, tall grass, and it actually ate so much of the grass because it can't be digested properly, clumped up inside their intestines, and then they needed an expensive, I think the surgery was almost like $2,500, $2,700 to get that out. So don't let your dog eat long grass. Um, and you know why dogs eat grass, right? There's a few reasons, a few, few reasons. Uh, and when you hear about it, it's just like, the, why does the dog follow us into the bathroom and all that stuff? When you hear about it, you're going to be like, wow, that does make sense. Um, but again, try not to let your dog eat grass. We'll get to that another time, like I say, but try not to let your dog eat grass, especially when it's other people's lawns, especially if somebody has really beautiful grass. Very strong chance there's pesticides on that grass. So be really careful about that. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the thing there after the uh, the, the, the colitis aspect of it, which uh, I'm impressed that I pronounce it properly, even with my accent. Uh, so, okay. I, my issue with Bauer, and we're going to be, my issue with Bauer that is quickly getting bigger and harder to manage him on a leash. If he sees someone on our walks and he immediately sparks and growling at the people. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, when I get back, I'll put the uh, link to my YouTube uh, um, aspect of, um, of dogs on leash and how to kind of understand that on a rudimentary basis of control. Uh, being leash ninja, having your dog understand that there's uh, that you ultimately have dominant control of your leash. So what that essentially means, and, and like I said, I'll kind of go over that because there's no use going over this. I mean, because I'm going to put up the link and you can watch it there. So what essentially is happening is that uh, uh, Bauer has been a dog that has been treated very lovingly, extremely lovingly. He has made a lot of eye contact and all that stuff in that video, in that two-second video, which also indicates that he has spent he spends a lot of physical time with his human beings in the sense that he he's like as much as he can try to get on you, but also learn. And I'm intuiting, intuiting, intuition-wise, intuitively uh, inferring, I guess, whatever, is that he will have. A Tend to try to lay, uh, to lay up on you, kind of like on an elbow kind of thing on your body, and that reason being the fact that he's been taught not to lay on you as much anymore because he's too heavy. But in the past, he's lay on you and like right. I mean, I, I've never had a Great Dane puppy, so I don't know. But um, um, they're usually 100 plus pounds by the time 120, you know, by the time they come to me. But um, so he, you know, you've you've been able to lay on him as you got heavy and heavy, you start to push him away. Are you understanding what I'm getting to now, uh, right? I'm trying to, to 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 infer or confer confer to you. Uh, so he went from the absolute love and adoration and uh, affection and emotional context and connection to the point where he's no longer kind of allowed in the same category of affection as he was before. So to him, right off the bat, there's a little bit of an issue, and that issue becomes self-esteem. Not self-confidence, not self-worth, not codependent aspects of it, but it is a, uh, a self-esteem issue, okay? So we got that part there. 
Um, and so also what meant uh, his leash aspects of it and all that stuff is the part that there has been uh, a lot of attempts after the fact for you to correct him on leash. So that once he already got away from you, like lunging on the leash or just excitedly pulling on the leash became lunging on the leash, all these other kinds of things that are happening, which then caused him to feel artificially that there was a threat. Because then you start negotiating and start cajoling and started trying to convince him cajoling to go, hey, please don't do that. You Don't be a bad dog and all that stuff. You're trying to convince him. He's saying, I'm not saying bad dog, but you're trying to convince Bauer not to pull anymore. And then when he did pull, you're like, why are you doing this? And then you change your tone because you're not yelling at him because I can tell you're not that kind of a, uh, you know abusive type of owner. You're not. But that change of tone affected him as well. So you got the low self-esteem and then you got the change of tone in your voice. I don't hear your voice. I don't see it. I I, the, I can't. I don't know what you saw, but I have a pretty strong uh, opinion from my uh, uh, from my um, observation here that you changed your tone and um, you had pushed him off, right? Okay, so there we go. Uh, so he's, uh, he starts uh, barking and growling at the people. Uh, he pulls and lunges to get to them. So then, what ends up happening there? He's pulling and lunging, so he's also overly excited. So that means his socialization. Um, kind of was kind of cool in the beginning, and then it kind of went down a bit as you started to have some challenges with the way of his weight. And, and as you attempted to integrate him, uh, you're still using the old skills of trying to correct him on leash while you're battling him back and forth on leash, etc. And that again going with the self esteem issue and the somewhat kind of like, mm, we don't need you. Uh, and then you know, uh, Williams, stop please. Um, okay, so, so that. Uh, if a student is brave and comes over, he will bark in their face. Once he senses they're not a threat, he'll stop for 15 seconds and then typically start barking in their face. So what he's done there, and that talks part about uh, another link uh, put up there in regards to dogs barking out the window. And that aspect of letting the, what he's essentially doing is, like I said earlier, I know my position in my family. I'm number six out of eight. I know my position. So what's happening on his end is that Bauer is trying to gain, earn, prove, show, validate his position in your home. Low self-esteem, codependency issues as well, uh, the, the inconsistency on the leash, and then all that kind of goes, what is my valuation in the home? What is my valuation with my family? So he starts to move, hey Rita, you're awake and I'm awake. Um, hello Norway. Um, okay, so there's that aspect of it. And then... Um, uh, then he stops for 15 seconds and starts sparking in the face again. So what ends up happening? Here you go. What, right? So it falls through on the same thing is that he's showing you, I'm doing my job, mama. Love me again. Like that Paul Newman song, Love Me Again. Uh, that's like four years ago. Uh, he's saying, mom, I, I did my job. So that's why he stops. Like, okay, acknowledge me. Acknowledge me. Like I said before on other other uh, uh, posts, uh, the vlogs, right, is... The little kid coming up to his mom and says and does a like a crayon drawing like that and says mom 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 and if you don't take that crayon drawing even though you know you're gonna throw it in the garbage you still have to acknowledge it that crayon drawing you have still have to acknowledge it right that you have it and you tell your child oh my gosh it's so beautiful right and we know those fake parent words right fake adult words right it's so beautiful and all that stuff. And you know, if you fake that, like, oh my gosh, you're so good. The, your, your child goes, mom, you don't really like it because they can hear it. Just like the dogs can hear the fakeness and the tone. We know when someone's being disingenuous to us. We know when we're talking to someone who's vacuous, who's who's phony. So then we use our real voice to go, oh my gosh, that is a really beautiful picture. I'm just going to put it over here as we do our newscaster voice on purpose because we don't, we can catch ourselves in the difference in tone and intonation and cadence and blah, blah, blah. So then we're like, well, we're blah, blah, blah. You're okay. So now our, our kids like, oh, they understood because they used their adult voice, but we faked it. Bauer needs to be the acknowledgement. So when he does stop at 15, when he stops right away, right away when Bauer stops, Immediately, immediately acknowledge him like good boy, and don't go like good boy. And I say it to him as if you're you're approving approving of his behavior. Good boy, Bauer. I know you have a female voice, a little bit higher tone, but good boy, Bauer. And then you hold him, and you don't pet him like that. Like I always say, another video, another blog, blog is don't you're not like trying to catch him on fire, right? The sensitivity, dogs processing a tenth of a second. This irritation, right? Same thing like going to see a movie with somebody, and they're going like this, they're doing this to you throughout the whole movie. You're like, you can't even watch the movie. You're like, stop moving your hand. 
right? Stillness. And then after a few seconds, uh, just judging on his behavior and the way he is like that, I wait four seconds of stillness. And then start banging you. Good boy. And like, you know, like that tone of voice when you want your dog to go to the bathroom outside so you can leave. And they, you're waiting for him to go back and they finally go. And you're like, good boy. Because you're actually happy for yourself. And when your kid goes potty, yeah, potty party. Because you're really like, now I don't have to clean it. Right? Four seconds for Bauer's particular personality and judging by the way his face is and how he's processing it at that, he's got a strategic, he, he's, he's got a, also an agility, a talent physically and his ability as well. You can tell by the way he moves and the way he observes. Physical ability, uh, a talent for uh, agility training. Um, you just see by the body position. It's really, really straightforward. Okay. Um, and once he senses that they're not a threat anymore, he'll stop for 15 seconds and he'll typically start barking in their face again. Because again, okay, or I just said that, right? Mom, pay attention. Did you not see me do this, right? Uh, you didn't do it? Well, I'm going to have to show you that I'm doing it. Right? It's like the kid at the playground is on, on, on something, on the, on the equipment. He's like, Mom, see me. And then you don't pay attention. Then he's like this, right? And like, oh, honey. Because the child knows I have to escalate the issue for you to understand that there's a threat but that how brave I am by risking my life even more so by proving my position that I earned it. See what I mean? The psychology about dogs. You're not going to get this from any behavior or, or, or trainer. And the other day, I think, um, uh, Suzanne Fentner actually, um, uh, tagged Roman Gottfried or something, some guy down in, uh, Oregon or whatever. It's supposed to be some great, uh, I'm not, I, I actually, I shouldn't be so rude about that. I, I did look at some of his stuff. It's, it's quite elementary. He's got these great concepts that he doesn't know how to find truth to it. And then he's quoting things from B.F. Skinner to make himself look smart. But he's quoting things from B.F. Skinner and relying on operant conditioning. And it's like, dude, do you not even understand that there's so many Google articles about B.F. Skinner being wrong about operant conditioning and trying to train dogs and human beings through aspects of incentive, essentially, and the four quadrants of that type of behavior. And he's quoting this guy as if he's... And authority, not realizing simple Google search, the guy's been debunked, especially in human science. And the kind of an animal and the dog has a job to do and all that stuff. It's like, dude, the dog doesn't have a job. The dog's just acting as a dog, just like Chris Rock said. Tigers being the tiger. That's what I'm saying. You get these people, like, and, I, and there's no he's trying to correct Suzanne. I mean, she's, you know, right. But the thing is that he's wrong. And the dogs he's working with are just mediocre aspects. And you can see that, uh, the, you know, it's an 18-second clip here. It's a 42-second clip here, you know. And then and there's like an, a minute and 12-second clip over here of him working with the dogs. And it's only selective. And then there are videos of him talking on video like me for 8 minutes, for 20 minutes, for 30 minutes. That's the difference. All my videos show, right? So I'm just like, uh, there are people who are following him and they're going down the wrong path. And they're objectifying their dog's behavior because of the lack of understanding because of B.F. Skinner. See what happens when you go on? You follow the wrong, incorrect path and you just keep going down that road and you're like, an hour later, you're like, oh, holy cow, I'm off, I'm off route, off route, off route. I'm off route 150 miles. I have to turn around again. The industry has been following this since 1897. Ivan Pavlov. Treat training a dog is, uh, with dysfunctions is, is counterintuitive. Food doesn't exist. Reward for it. None of it exists. Ian Ledger, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Ledger, Rebecca Ledger, Karen Pryor, all, all these other people, Ian Dunbar. The crutch is the food. You never heal anybody. You never heal a dog. You never heal anybody with food. Well, comfort food. Okay, I talked about that before as well. Um, okay, so he starts up again. Then uh, you know, starts to face. He tends. Then he tends to try to get, get away. Like he seems scared. Because what happened is he realizes that he gets in trouble from you afterwards. Because you've changed your tone. You're not getting angry at him as per se, but you've changed your tone to that tone where he hates to hear because it makes him feel bad, self-esteem issue. And he's like, ah, I got in trouble from mom, but I still got acknowledged. Right? 
still got acknowledged. So that's the issue. You see how complicated this whole this whole route of his behavior is. We took him to the him and Sprout to the dog uh, Sprocket. Sorry, sorry Sprocket uh, to the dog park, and he did wonderful with the other dogs. He's playing gently with the other dogs. Some more aggressive than he would than than him would bully him, and I'd have to shoot the other dog way. So right there, you're doing the parenting in the dog park, showing uh, uh, Bauer that you're protecting him. That you're watching out for him. The same thing, like I said to, about Ivy's uh, husky uh, hooligan that I worked with at uh, the dog park, a puppy who wasn't listening to her and all that stuff. And she's like, "Wow, uh, he, he's so much calmer and all that stuff after just talking and dealing with him in a certain way." So then Bauer knows that you're taking care of him. You're protecting him. You're acknowledging his behavior while he's running around as a little kid, having fun. The other dogs are. To buy. So what he's expecting is that what you're doing in the dog park is repeated outside on leash. It's a simple fix. That's it. That's $230, please. Plus tax. That's it. It's that simple. Four second hold on him, then make a movement afterward of that, and then you, right? Using a regular tone of voice and all that. That's it. It's, it's that simple. This is an issue that Okay, well, I'm going to read on. Uh, some more, okay, so bully him and push him away. But if a person approached at the park to talk to us, he would bark his head off at the person. Okay, so he barks at the person. So that's jealousy, envy, right? You know, the dog comes up between and all that stuff and protect and all that. So he's saying the fragile aspect, the low self-esteem, the codependency issue. Don't come near my family. Don't come near the my, my mummy. Because you're going to try to take her away from me. And I don't have enough confidence. Self-esteem. To know that my mom's going to be there for me constantly. So it's an easy fix. Just keep saying his name every once in a while. In the same tone of voice that you did before. When you come to him for four seconds. That's it. Uh, jealousy. Envy. Jealousy is a complicated emotion. So this is so bizarre and banal and mental that these scientists are saying that uh, dogs have basic emotional processing, but they also experience jealousy. Jealousy is, is complex. Jealousy is premeditated behavior. It's worry. It's consequential. It's reactionary. It's all of it. It's a human emotion. It's a complicated human emotion that is illogical in process. That's what I'm saying. The behaviors, the, the, the animal scientists, they are playing both sides of the road on us. And the trainers and behaviors are like, right, you know, the gruel is dripping down their face. And they're like, like I've always said to people uh, who've, who trolled me and, and, and all that stuff, you don't think I can do what I can do? Send me any dog. I'll accept. It doesn't matter. I've been saying that for almost four years now. No one has ever taken me up on that challenge. I've had people bring dogs to me after they were referred by other trainers and behaviors in town, thinking, oh, we're going to send them. Go see James Chai. And I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. And they're like, wow. And then they go back to the other trainer and they tell me, yeah, James did this and that. And then, and then the trainer's like, oh, okay. I've seen the email responses. There's like one line, oh, okay. That's what I'm saying. It's not magic. Them doing it. it's what they're doing themselves because I teach the owner how to do it, how to see the nuanced behavior of their own dogs, right? <laughs> the psychogenetic aspect. I tell them they, the psychological issue of their dog is, and then they understand. If you know why someone hurts, if you know that the guy's mom died, now you know why he's a jerk to you on the phone. That's it. That's his issue. He's lost your love. Bowers lost mom's love. Viscerally. And you see that hurts me here. My voice um, <clears throat> my voice is a little bit uh, softer, a little uh, difficult because I feel for, for Bauer. I'm just looking at his pictures. He just wants mom's love. He wants his family's love. He wants that reliability. Whether or not there's a lot of transient aspects of behavior in the home, like people going in and out, you have the children part-time and all that stuff. He still doesn't have that reliability. And I suspect that Sprocket is spending a lot of time with you or on his humans and being held on his humans. What do you think? Bauer's looking at there going, that used to be me. 
now I'm not even allowed to be fully on mom, my whole body anymore. Or dad. That used to be me. What is that? Oh, it's jealousy. Dog park jealousy. See, see how easy it is to put, sorry. Uh, see how easy it is to put all the pieces together? Well, for me, it's very easy for me to put all the pieces. Just by reading, never having met your dog and all these other trainers' behaviors that, and all these groups say, you can't do aggressive dog training over online if you've never met the dog. Dude, there it is. It's all done. Melissa, this is this is, this is is a really simple issue. Uh, you guys are watching this. Next time you read something like this and somebody else's post, you'll be like, yeah, you know what? I remember James saying this. And then you start looking at them and you start reading this stuff. You'll be like, yeah, it does make sense now. He's never bit anyone or, 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 or nipped anyone ever. So he's not an aggressive dog. He's an insecure dog. Yes, right. He's low self-esteem. He's lost what he used to have from you, which was that same visceral aspect of love. And then he sees the disparity when Sprocket gets held and covered in the same way that he used to be held. And he is outside on leash and, and not knowing whether or not mom can protect him and whether or not mom approves of his behavior. My, bo my goal for Bauer is to be able to go for a leisurely walk. I want him to relax. He's constantly scanning the area. So the le leisurely walk on leash, like I said, I'll put the link up on how to handle a leash to be a leash ninja, how to have dominant control of your leash. Really simple, fucking dominant control on the leash. Like when you watch that, you, you listen to me on that one, you're just going to go, yeah, wow, that's so simple. And that's, that, controlling a dog on leash is an entire three, four sessions that would cost somebody three to five hundred dollars to learn how to do. And I show in the video is you just do this and this. And this is why there's no such thing as dominant control by the dog. But there's dominant control by the human being. And people are like sending me messages like. I thought so. Nipping is when the dog is just kind of like this. Not like this. <laughs> Not like this. But you know, right? nipping. And that's why I said before. The dog understands. If they're biting hard or not, when they're playing with their friends, the dog friends, they know if they're biting hard or not. I know when I'm biting hard on my own hand or when I'm, well, I'm not biting anybody. But if I was, right, you know, anyways, right, when we were kids, right, we knew all that stuff or what you guys do alone in your bedroom, you know. But the thing is that we know how hard we're biting. The dog does too as well. How do you think you can see a dog pick up a puppy and not kill it? Their own puppy, right, you know, whatever. How does a dog pick up a, a, an egg without crushing it? Minky. Minky. Thank you. Minky's got a beef bone. It's the same thing. William's here again. Same thing again, right? Let me just show you here. There's Minky with the beef bone. See? Minky. Hi, Minky. You see that? Beef bone and he yawned too. That's what I'm saying. Just talk to him. We got a, we got a high value target right there. What did I say? Minky. Hi, Minky. William walks by, no issue. I try to keep the dogs out of here now because it just gets too much. Um, okay, so he's constantly scanning the area and looking on the lookout for a threat, right? And then you can see the behavior in just that little two-second video in regards to his processing aspect of it. It's it's a frame aspect of processing that part of it, which means that he doesn't have a control over what he's doing because he's so much not necessarily alert. He just doesn't know what he's looking for anymore. He's just looking for an excuse to prove that he's doing his job. He's so focused that he doesn't hear me. He has learned basic command. Okay, he's all right. So he's so focused that he doesn't hear me. Talking too much, talking in the wrong tone of voice. Um, I'll post this up here. And uh, uh, Melissa, please take a look at that. And then you can respond back to it. And then have a better idea of what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll, um, you'll be able to see uh, uh, what it's all about. The, the nipping on thing, uh, Rita, is, is a different aspect of the insecurity, uh, a whole bunch of different things. Like I say, it's always good to have to have, to have con context because, you know, like people say the Formosan, they have that or, or Jindo, whatever, they, you know, they'll, they'll run around and nip people or whatever. Why is that? But then the reality is other dogs do it too. German Shepherds, they all do it. They all do it. Great Danes. Great Danes don't run around and do it because they're too, too big. They don't need to either. There's like... That's it. They move their neck and they're ready nipping you. 
So, um, uh, Melissa, so that's the issue we got. So the first thing I would say is, again, just um, reconnecting with him in the sense of touching him for four seconds in the park aspect of it. Um, on leash, uh, watch the video on, on dealing with dogs uh, on leash as well. And the acknowledgement that he needs to understand. You got such a transient aspect of uh, people, right? A lot of people transiting in and out, right? Transient aspect of it. No, Minky. 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 Thank you. Uh, so a lot of transient aspect of it, right? So there's a lot of insecurity. So so then it just kind of points to the fact that Bauer is not really sure where he is at the family at all times. But it doesn't sound like he's having any reaction to the kids or whatever. Minky. 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 William's literally on his bone. Hi, Minky. William's literally on his bone picking it up. Now William has the bone and Minky's over here now. Um, so, uh, you know, just try that adjustment talk. Rekindle and reconnect that type of love with him, with Bauer, because he's seeing Sprocket getting the attention that he used to get, right? You know, the envy, the jealousy, that part of it, right? The complicated aspect of it. It's just rudimentarily processed on his behavior, but it all makes sense. So that it's, it's, it's that that straightforward. Uh, I say happy Thanksgiving to all the uh, fellow Canadians out here and, and all who are following me. Uh, please again subscribe to my channel my YouTube channel, please help me get to a thousand subscribers, help me uh, be able to spread out the word of what's going on. Uh, I just chose a thousand too because it's just a, a nice even number. Um, and uh, I want to thank everybody who has been um, uh, supporting what I'm doing, who who have uh, um, you know stood up for me, uh, who have shared my work, who have commented as well, commenting and liking, uh, you, you know, liking, reacting to my uh, my vlogs and all that stuff. Uh, the best way that we can do to change this world is to educate those who are incorrectly incorrectly leading the world uh, astray with uh, with um, wrong information that's killing six million dogs a year. Sixty percent of success rate, barely sixty percent success rate with a hundred percent of the dogs. No, that's not cool. Thank you so much. Happy Sunday. We will talk tomorrow. Bye bye.